now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Road to Marrakesh, a look at the annual meetings of the World Bank and IMF, which are taking place later next week. Uh, very excited to have this panel together to share their thoughts and perspectives, as well as have a bit of a wider open dialogue with, the, uh, with yourselves on other people's plans and perspectives for the annual meeting. Uh, just to note that this is being recorded and will be posted on What World Assembly uh, later on, and I'll share the link in the chat. Very pleased to have an exciting panel today. Uh, with us uh, speaking first be Mariana Polly from Christian Aid. Uh, that'll be followed by Yungung Theophilus Jong from Afrodad. And then we'll have Claire Healy from E3G, finally with Iskander Edini Vernot from Imal. So without further ado, I would like to pass over to Mariana to kick off our discussion and take us through, uh, through perspectives and priorities for the annual meetings. And Marianne is going to share her screen with us. So that's happening now. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And good afternoon to you all, at least from where I am in the world based in the UK. So I um, did this PowerPoint just to give you a bit of a flavor of the maybe the main priorities uh, for uh, annuals in relation to climate finance and some of the challenges that we've seen in Marrakesh. But perhaps what I would like to start our conversation with is with the overall question. Should the World Bank have a greater role in climate finance? And the reason why I ask this question is because of their over-reliance on, on private sector as a solution to deliver climate finance. We know how much uh, developing countries have been really united in the UN climate negotiations to asking for a new additional public uh, grants-based finance, uh, so much needed to fund loss and damage, adaptation, and an adjust energy transition. And we also know that the Paris Agreement is really based on the common but different responsibilities and capabilities that a number of developed countries have the historical uh, responsibility, their the historical uh, uh, polluters, and they should pay their fair share when it comes to uh, climate finance. So to some extent, the Bretton Woods institutions, they overlook the pivotal role of public finance must play in driving that policy transformation. Um, we know how much private investments have a limited role on a just energy transition. They are inadequate for adaptation uh, and, and even, uh, even worse for loss and damage. Um, we know that to some extent World Bank is a major focus because the IMF is normally mainly in charge of providing the, 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 the finance uh, and expenditure. We have uh, the news of the RSD, the Resilient Sustainability Trust, which we'll touch in a, in a, in a, in a, moment, in a moment, but that comes with a number of uh, uh, conditionalities, it's essentially a mechanism to provide more loans attached to conditionalities to make a uh, more business friendly uh, environment uh, in different sp spheres. Um, we have for the annuals the World Bank uh, Evolution Roadmap, uh, which has been uh, the World Bank has been going to setting a number of uh, uh, re reforms, and this is focusing on balancing their sheets in terms of the risking and approaches to private sector. And it is really about increasing the capacity of the World Bank on lending. I haven't read actually this, the latest version just came out a few days ago, and it is uh, entitled um, "Living and Extreme Poverty in a Livable Planet," which I think it sets the bar really low. But the, the, actually the, the question on where should climate finance comes from, which is central uh, to the annuals, should be look, looked in the macro picture of how to reverse the financial flows between the, the North and South as more money flows out of the global South to the global North. And within that, what could create more fiscal space in developing countries? Uh, so within that, uh, how can we, how can we, you know, preventing the build off on sustainable debt and the need for debt cancellation, uh, stop ta taxing, tax dodging and, and creating uh, 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 taxes uh, more in a fair way. Stopping the austerity measures, 85% of world population is under austerity, uh, and, and providing additional external financial, but in a way also uh, regulating private uh, financing as well. Um, and in that sense, 
uh, we know that the, the World Bank shouldn't become the world's climate bank. One of the main asks from civil society is to have an external independent review of the, this uh, World Bank uh, development um, effectiveness that started about uh, five years ago um, and, and essentially uh, revisited that approach of further debt inducing uh, mechanisms on expansion of, of climate finance. Now, coming to governance, we know the Bretton Woods institutions uh, are have very, uh, the global South is really underrepresented. Uh, and as Gutierrez said, the global financial system is, is failing in the, in the developing world. Uh, we need a system that works for the vulnerable, not just the powerful. And that is very much at the heart of what uh, 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 some of the, the, the discussions um, that uh, um, are, are happening. Now, there are two forums that are kind of complicated. The first one is uh, the World Bank has been proposed to host the loss and damage fund. We saw this, this in the transition committee uh, this discussions. Uh, this has been pushed by the US and by the EU. Um, when in fact, the World Bank is one of the major funders of fossil fuels. It's not stopping and it should actually first ensure it's Paris aligned, which is another key issue for, for the annuals. It has its own rules and, and, and procedures which are misaligned with the NFCC principles. Uh, it prevents direct access by national governments and it's a bank in the end of the day, in the end of the day, it's, it's largely based uh, on on loans, and there is a number of accountability issues. So the main demand for civil society here is to have a loss and damage fund as a newly independent entity, so that it can be fit for purpose, driven by re recipient countries, and aligned with the principles of equity and fairness, and not uh, behold to donor countries. Um, we also know there is an unequal voting system, and there during the annuals, there is a discussion, especially on the IMF 16 quarter review, which could be a critical opportunity for the global South to have a, a, a bigger say when it comes to global economic um, governance. Um, the as I was touching again, I think the one of the critical issues for our climate agenda is the lack of Paris alignment. Um, we know the World Bank still consider gas as a transition fuel. Um, Different, the different circumstances from uh, developing uh, uh, countries uh, going slow in terms of their uh, energy transition is happening because they don't have the enough financial support. Um, we see that the, you know, the, the climate uh, uh, impact uh, on loss and damage suffered by the client countries already undermining their developing goals uh, and the, the, the alignment is setting a really low bar. There's a number of loopholes for business and users to, to continue. Um, so on what we are really asking is for the that the investments to be uh, aligned, including the exclusion of fossil gas, uh, driving a renewable economy, uh, supporting a just and a transition, um, and something that really works across the board. Um, also, there is the need in terms of increasing uh, their investments in renewable um, energy. The decrease of uh, fossil fuel investment is not translating to more clean uh, energy finance. Most of the finance for renewable energies is in form of loans. Uh, um, and we know that it's, it, it really privileged like large scale projects for exports. So to what extent can we have a policy that are really benefiting communities should be um, at the heart uh, of social and environmental standards has to be uh, um, strengthened and the, the issue for clean energy access so people, especially in Africa, can leapfrog to a, a clean future is um, essential. Uh, quickly, also for the annuals, uh, we have uh, the allocation of the special drawing uh, rights. Um, so in from 2021 on the 650 billion that were uh, uh, allocated, um, they were not done in a, in a fairly way. So uh, we still have a promise from the G20 about channeling the 100 billion unused um, um, SDRs that should be providing the forms of grants uh, without any conditionality, uh, um, or if not directly that being to maybe it could be uh, channeled through the AFDB and, and scaled up. And there should be a new, a new, uh, a new allocation of SDRs, but not on the same basis of the, the 
the way the way they were located the first time round. Otherwise, developing countries will receive very very little. So there should be a, a reform on the way that SDRs are. Uh, uh, done. We know this has been dis discussed in the board. We know there's not consensus, and uh, within civil society, we'll be continue to push around uh, those messages. And SDRs are channeled through the RST, the Resilient Sustainability Trust, which was created to channel uh, those uh, uh, this, this this funding. It's quite problematic because it comes with a number of uh, uh, conditionalities attached to it, especially on um, austerity measures, fiscal consolidations, etc. And uh, on the five countries that already received money from the RST, Jamaica, Barbados, Rwanda, Costa Rica, and Bangladesh, uh, we have seen some damaging effects. And Kristalina, during the spring, said there is another forty in the pipeline to 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 receive that. Um, so yeah, it is a quite of a problematic um, uh, fund. Uh, last but not least, I just wanted to touch on debt um, and the need for urgent debt re re restructuring and debt architecture reform. I think I've gone over time. Apologies. Which actually, the, uh, my next colleague is going to talk more about the debt issue. So I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it there. Just wanted to conclude by saying that these are the main issues for the annuals and a number of activities will be happening both uh, uh, inside on the formal spaces, but also since this is happening in Marrakesh, first time for 50 years in, in African soil, there'll be a number of activities uh, uh, happening, uh, uh, a counter summit, a parallel summit, and a vibrant civil society uh, in the streets demanding action. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Marina. That's that's really useful. Great overview and sets the stage very well. And I didn't realize it's the first time in 50 years the World Bank has had its three every three years. They they move the bank's annual meetings in Africa, which is excellent for those um, I put in the chat. But just to say um, Mariana's PowerPoint, as well as other material resources will be posted on the event page. And the link is in the chat. If you have other resources that you want to share, please put them in the chat or email me. Uh, and I can give that later. But let's, without further ado, let's go over to Dr. Young, who's going to speak to us from Afrodet, uh, and hand over to you, Young Yang. Yeah, good afternoon, Kel, and uh, good afternoon, or morning, or evening to everyone, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Um, and thank you, Mariana, for the presentation. And uh, I think from Afrodet's side, a lot of the things that you have actually highlighted um, resonate with our expectations you know looking forward into the um, into the um, annual meetings and specifically the difference that this will bring this time around um, uh, let me start with issues around the climate um, I think one concerning thing about the cl climate has been that um, the debt implications of 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 climate finance, you know, of energy transition, you know, it's something that has not been quite considered in the ongoing discussion, so has been overlooked. Given the fact that African countries are struggling first with the current uh, um, uh, debtedness, we have the Sustainable Development Goals and the National Development Plans, where they are still waiting to get these resources at scale, you know, to implement these plans. And then on the other hand, they are faced not only with uh, um, the need to, you know, uh, embark on the energy transition, but then there are multiple crises, you know, a lot of conflicts in African countries uh, uh, that African countries are dealing with. You know, limited economic opportunities that provide employment. You know, this general uh, uh, weak, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, resources, resource base. You know, to support social programs, social welfare programs. You know, that actually uh, generate the kind of prosperity or or, or support. Uh, you know. Um, uh, African citizens actually to live a decent life for themselves. It's something that the governments are actually struggling with, but now they actually have to make this sacrifice for a transition, even when they are the least polluters, you know, when we can consider that they are the least polluters. So there is a debt implication to this that has not uh, been discussed, that has been overlooked, and we think 
the annual meetings is also an opportunity for us to highlight this and it should be at the mind, I know in the back of the minds of of uh, civil society organizations and all stakeholders involved. Um, and then away from issues around the climate, uh, uh, we have seen the current dates of web, of wave of indebtedness in African countries and countries, I mean, I've not managed to get any solutions to this. Uh, the best we have got has been the common framework. And we can say that the common framework, it's not even as ambitious as you had the HIPIC and the M MDRI, right? The scale of indebtedness uh, uh, back then was not as huge. And the problems were not as many, you know, as we have at the moment. But then the solutions are not that very ambitious in terms of addressing this indebtedness, which is something that uh, we also expect that uh, this meeting should be able to offer probably, you know, uh, positive solutions, you know, for African countries to deal with the current uh, wave of indebtedness. And beyond just this indebtedness, there are structural issues, you know, that are the, are the heart of this indebtedness, right? We have structural issues, uh, the global financial architecture, you know, it's related to issues around illicit financial flows. Uh, that, you know, it's at the source of recurrent indebtedness uh, in the African countries, which means resolving the current debts without actually, you know, resolving the structural issues will just be like postponing the solutions because we almost thought HIPIC and MDRI was going to provide the solutions that uh, will uh, see African countries and other global South countries, you know, debt free. But apparently this hasn't worked because, you know, the root causes of this indebtedness has not been addressed. And that's why we think issues around the global financial architecture, you know, reforming the global financial architecture is very important. And one of the things that we'll be watching out for going to uh, the annual meetings this year. And the SDRs, yes, we are also interested in the SDRs, the rechanneling. Uh, Maria and, um, mentioned the austerity policies that are related to rechanneling the SDRs, which is something that uh, we at AfroDAT we actually concerned about, given the fact that uh, 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 a lot of countries in Africa, since the uh, structural adjustment programs, you know, have been in a position where they kept keep, you know. Um, you know, uh, running for assistance to the IMF and the World, World Bank. And this comes with conditionalities, uh, which hurt social programs, which actually do not actually put citizens at the focus, you know, of, of whatever financing or measures that are. This has been all about finance, um, I mean, about uh, um, uh, making the most benefit from lending and you know, and and least concerned about welfare in terms of whether this actually delivers, you know, the development that we are, are actually uh, advocating for. Uh, we know that this responsibility is not just for the international financial community, but we are also aware the need for African governments to take part of that responsibility. And which is also something that we are advocating for at the at the regional level, because uh, this will not just happen like a one sided thing that we have to keep, you know, uh, shifting the blame, you know, and without taking taking responsibility, you know, uh, as African countries. And um, by and large, some of the expectations from from our side is uh, like we had our AFCOD this year, that's the Af Africa Conference on Debt and Development, where reflections were on uh, what an African world order would look like. Um, what is it that, you know, uh, what kind of world order do we actually need where Africa will actually have a voice, you know? Where do you get a voice and representation for Africa when it comes to issues of development financing, where Africa will not just be at the receiving end, but actually... Uh, part of that decision making, because for us, we have also noticed that uh, most of the times 
when we go to this IMF and World Bank meetings, we are actually far off, you know, out of the perimeters of where the real decisions are, are being made. And it is our expectation that uh, with the meetings coming to Africa, it is our expectations that uh, we should start thinking in terms of giving Africa a place, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, global decision-making spaces. Of course, recently you heard of the G20 Africa joining the G20, which has been welcomed, you know, in some quarters. But for us, it's also concerning because uh, this also, you know, uh, uh, compromises the, uh, you know, the, 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 the push, you know, for more democratic solutions, you know, to Africa's development financing problems, you know, through the United Nations. It is true that G20 is that influential, you know, voice when it comes to development financing, but there is also this idea of uh, it's the highest bidder or the, the who, like we say, he who pays the piper actually calls the tin, which means this is also about financing this. You know, it's about uh, who holds the most money, but we want solutions through the financing for development process, through the United Nations, you know, that's supposed to offer solutions that uh, actually, you know, take into consideration the development interest, but not just the financing interest, but also the development countries of, uh, I mean, the development interest of African countries and, uh, and the global south. So there is quite a lot that we're expecting. And besides the, 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 the expectations, we have a lot of side events that we will be co-hosting with other partners in the global south. And then we have a lot of other mini meetings, you know, happening at the sidelines of, um, of the of the conference, which uh, we will also be part of. So uh, we are looking up to the meetings with a lot of expectations and uh, definitely uh, just to see what difference, you know, this annual meetings is going to make for Africa and the Global South. Thank you, Kel. Excellent. Thank you for that. And the democratic aspect that's around social and economic development is, is a key point. Uh, if anyone does have uh, a, a list of possible uh, events and side events, do include in the chat. I will looking to put this together as part of the resource at the event page, and I'll collect whatever calendars are around. So that will be an ongoing resource for, for people to take a look at as we go into the annuals. But let's hand over now to Claire from E3G to uh, share your thoughts, please, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Cal. Um, I'll just uh, limit to a few comments because I know we want to get to uh, a Q&A. Um, I agree with Mariana and Young Gong um, that we should have high expectations, right, going into Marrakesh and these annual meetings because I think the needs are high, right? And I think we've all got to be grounded in the fact that we're here and we do this and these institutions exist somewhat um, I think uh, because we've got to be focused on the most vulnerable amongst us all, right? Um, because as you say, we're at this point where, again, I mean, hunger is killing 25,000 people a day, every day. It's like 10% of the world's population, right? Um, you know, the COVID, the pandemic, the learning losses have been de devastating, I think, the world over. And as uh, you know, uh, the other speakers have said, like countries are uh, in debt distress, right? Um, so I, I, I think the level of need is uh, humongous and growing and dire, right? So we should have high expectations. And I think we should always have high expectations, but now more than ever. Um, and I think it's right when you look at these institutions that have been around for, I don't know, all these things, 80 years next year, that the focus should always be on their modernization, right? I mean, evolution, they should be constantly evolving. And I get that that's hard with any big bureaucracy. Uh, I think, I don't know if anyone's worked in a bureaucracy, you know, it's challenging to say the least, but I think it should be the constant endeavor. We should never, ever be settling for the status quo and business as usual, right? Ever. And especially if, um, you know, you look at, I mean, and I say modernizing because look at now, even with education, and the fact that we have AI and um, dig dig digitalization, I can never say that word. You know, we should be constantly shifting and changing our models and questioning our assumptions and looking for new and better way of doing things. Um, 
you know, as new challenges, but also new opportunities um, come online. And I say all that before I say about climate. So obviously E3G, we are, you know, our mission is a climate safe world for all. And the for all is very important because, um, you know, this is both a challenge and an opportunity story. But I think the fact of the matter is uh, development, um, economic growth, prosperity, poverty eradication, all now has to take place within this context of a carbon constrained warming world, right? And I like the new mission shift, I know livable planet, I think it's actually pretty smart and sophisticated, you know, the three <laughs> words on the end. And I think that changes, I think it's true, because all of this has to take place in the context of the planetary changes that we're living through. And I think those words, it's not just climate, there's also livable planet includes you know, disease, free of disease with water, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's actually a very smart move. And so I'm hoping in Marrakesh um, shareholders can agree that and we move past, personally speaking, this to me, this, I think, a false uh, dichotomy, this false choice of development or climate, right? I think I'm hoping we can put that to bed and move on, right? Because it, the three points I think I'd like to make, I think, Given the level of need, I think it has to be not either or, but more and more, right? We need more money for development. We need more money for IDA. We need more attention and creativity and, you know, commitment to coming up with debt solutions. As Yung Gong said, clearly the framework we have is not fit for purpose. So we need more of all of that. IDA needs a injection, right? Given these numbers, people are dying of hunger. We can't have that. The numbers are going up, not down. IDA needs an injection. But we also need more money, more attention on climate. And when I say climate, I mean, when you just unpack that, you know, what does that actually mean? It means building infrastructure in countries that helps with their development. But that infrastructure has to make sense in a more modern frame, which is a net zero world, right? So it's building out infrastructure, you know, trains, schools, hospitals, what have you, right? But in a way that A, builds their resilience to the impacts we know are coming, as well as takes carbon out of the atmosphere, right? Um, so I think all of that, you know, that has to be just, I think, um, my view is every single cent that the World Bank and the other MDBs spend should be 100% Paris aligned, right? That's my own view. I know we can argue about that. But to me, in 2023, I was going to say 2022, 2023, like it's code red. I mean, again, I'm not a scientist, but the scientists are telling us it's flashing, right? So I feel like all this time, development or climate, we need to move on. I think development has to be in this new reality, right? And so we need more money for development, but it has to reflect this, uh, this carbon constrained world that we live in and the impacts that are coming that we know are gonna hit the vulnerable more than anybody, right? So I think we just need to get on. So number one, it's more and more, right? And the level, I, I like sort of the G20 report that is putting out the quantum, the scale. It always frustrates me when we talk about the level of need and then we just pivot to like a few million here, or even if I'm honest, a hundred billion from you know 2009, right? No, we're talking trillions, right? And so I like the G20, the report that came out, we've only seen volume one, which talks about a bigger MDB system. I'm looking forward to volume two that gets into the better, you know, how we make it a better system. But they're talking trillions, right? They're talking tripling the overall baseline for the banks to 390 billion, and then doing so in such a way that can pull in private finance, which you know obviously we have to shift all of that. So I like that they're putting the scale out there, but in terms of what's on the agenda, and these are the two points I'd like to make. So like mainstreaming, I think I've already made that point. Everything has to be mainstreamed throughout not just the World Bank, but all the other MDBs and throughout all the public banks. And then there's a whole, you know, a, a, a arm of this work that's focused on the private banks and the, cent the central banks and the private banks. Everything, we should be mainstreaming and shifting these flows, right, uh, to build out the, the sort of infrastructure we need. Um, and so the mainstreaming point is there, but I think in terms of the more money, and again, I'm hoping, aside from the mission statement change, Obviously, we've had some movement from the evolution roadmap. Obviously, they're implementing some of the capital adequacy reforms. 
50 billion, I think they announced at the spring for the World Bank over 10 years. But we can see at the ADB, they're talking about through CAF and locking 100 billion. And I think we should be looking at all the MDBs. That, of course, is just the start, right? What I think we need are very clear benchmarks for what a bigger, better banking system looks like and what it means and what it means, not just in inputs, you know, dollars, trillions in, but outputs, lived lives. And I think we need to sort of very quickly sort of build that out and coalesce around that so that shareholders don't sort of call, you know, job done. We've done a bit of this. We've done a bit of that. We've modernized. We've evolved. Now we move on. I think we've got to have a very clear sense of ambitious benchmarks so we keep the pressure on. So mainstreaming is one, more money, and I think we could earn a lot more money through CAF. And I like what the new president of the bank is saying, right? We've got to, you know, I hate this, I hate this analogy, squeezing the lemon. But I do think we can get a lot more out of the banks, like using the leverage we have now so that they use the capital they have, because we've got to make every penny go as far as possible. Um, so I think there's a lot of exciting stuff there, which again, a few years ago, uh, everybody that had been doing this work for a while is sort of this eye roll, eye roll. We've tried CAF before, it's never going to happen. So I do think we should give credit now that we have a president and shareholders that are really trying to get some more reforms done through their frameworks, including callable capital, right? But of course, that's not enough, right? Then we need we need to be talking about injections. Now, whether that's a capital increase, I think obviously we need a capital increase sooner rather than later. But again, I'm very aware of the context in which I sit in Washington right now, which we can you know, talk about in a bit. I mean, the Congress can't agree to fund their own government, right, at the minute, the United States government, let alone other governments. This is the reality. But we need to figure out. Um, but I do think, again, uh, President Banger talking about a boost, 100 billion, 125 billion. I think shareholders should be looking at more creative ways. Um, so they're not paralyzed or captured by the United States Congress or the fiscal situation in the UK. And I feel like they are looking at that. So we get a boost to get, get an injection. Then the question is, and I'll stop here, where we put it, where it goes, where it sits, how it's ring fenced, so that it is spent on um, providing concessional finance, like subsidizing countries and projects and packages that really do help with these global challenges that we face, because obviously they'll need some subsidy. So I think the looking at the plumbing of this thing, I think is important too. So in Marrakesh, I'm looking for all of these things, but also looking at, you know, if there is more money coming, where it comes from and where it goes so that we can make sure it's directed to um, provide concessional financing and incentives for some of these global challenges that we're all talking about. I'll end there, Kel, for now. Excellent. Well, thank you much, Claire. And um, really appreciate that sort of look at sort of practical realities of what we have to look at in Marrakesh. I like your 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 comment is not either or, it's more and more. And also looking at the outputs. We're talking a lot about what we're need, the World Bank needs and the inputs, but I think you're right, benchmarking the outputs is, is critically important to if we're going to actually make the World Bank useful. Just to say before I hand over to Iskander, Please start typing some questions into the chat. The way we're going to do it, if you type your question in the chat, we'll then call on you to, to share your question live, if you like. If you do not want to do that, just make that known in the chat. We'll just, I'll read out your question. But start putting some questions in there because after Eskinder, we're going to go to the Q&A. So without further ado, Eskinder from Amal, do you want to take over? With, with pleasure. Thank you, Kel. Um, so, hello everyone and, and good afternoon, actually from the north of Morocco, uh, from the city of Tangier. Um, as, as, as Carl said, I, I work for EMAL, which is a, a, an independent non-profit uh, think tank uh, based here in Morocco. Um, so yeah, thanks to Carl for, for hosting us and, and thanks to friends from, from Christian Aid and, and Afrodad and, and E3G for, for making the time, but also providing uh, distinct insights, I think, into their their, uh, their different perspectives and, and points of view um, and sense of priorities on, 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 these, uh, on these matters uh, that we will be addressing in Marrakesh. So um, we're looking forward to, to welcoming you there um, in one of our historic cities. I think the, um, the point has been made that it, it's been 50 years since the last uh, uh, time these uh, Bretton Woods had their annual meetings on African soil. Um, and I think that from maybe from an African uh, point of view, uh, that already uh, perhaps uh, arguably says uh, quite a bit. 
Um, but these meetings, nevertheless, are increasingly important, uh, not just for international development, but for, for climate efforts um, as well. Um, we know that there are competing priorities for um, this conference and for these institutions, um, I would say, and we can talk about that more later, but um, I would say that the priorities of, of Africa are not, not the same as as, as other uh, shareholders and some of the major developed country shareholders. So, I mean, I think hopefully what we're moving toward is convergence uh, in that regard, uh, where um, we can come up with something that uh, the different parts of the world can agree on. Um, I mean, suffice to say, of course, Africa has a long and complicated relationship with the, the Bretton Woods institutions, um, both in terms of the politics of climate in development finance as well as the politics of, of uh, development uh, within climate finance. And some of uh, our, uh, our other panelists have, have spoken about this uh, briefly. Um, but I mean, I think specifically we can say there are major contestations about the additionality of finance from, from developed countries, um, in addition to contestations around uh, governance and whether the World Bank is, is, is the right institution to play a central role in, in climate finance. And these, these debates have have histories, um, and and obviously we've seen them manifest this this year. Um, so the you know the there are the the current debates around whether the World Bank, uh, whether and to what extent the World Bank should be responsible for the new loss and damage fund agreed at uh, COP twenty seven in Egypt last year, um, and th this is a reflection of, of perhaps a longer standing uh, debate which which goes back uh, 10 or more years, uh, you know, about uh, around the time of Copenhagen and, and after the 100 billion, and when countries were debating the, 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 the future of climate finance and its architecture. Um, and essentially, um, around the time you had, I think, uh, developed countries, which uh, essentially uh, argued for a central role for, for the World Bank and, and the MDBs in this, in this architecture, uh, for climate finance, whereas uh, developing countries uh, sought uh, different institutions over which they had uh, a greater share in the uh, governance and decision making. Um, and so that was why obviously we have the creation of the, of the Green Climate Fund as a United Nations uh, institution. Um, and we've spoken about other UN processes uh, before. Um, but, but I mean, we've we, we've seen this debate this year, um, uh, earlier this year at the summit uh, in in Paris, that was convened by uh, M President Macron of France. Uh, we had uh, President Ruto of, of of Kenya, who obviously uh, famously uh, or virally maybe called him out, uh, saying, uh, you know, Emmanuel, you're not listening to us. Uh, we, we, we're not saying we want uh, more finance for the, the World Bank. We want uh, institutions that, uh, that we have a, a say in. So, I mean, there are these, these dynamics uh, that uh, are, are important to, to, uh, to consider. Um, and I, I think it's worth always looking at the, um, uh, the positioning uh, as formally established for the African countries. Um, they have a, a proper process with the African Caucus of Finance Ministers which uh, met last year uh, to prepare its position in, in Morocco ahead of the annuals then, and this year it met in, um, with, with Cabo Verde. Um, and if you look at that uh, document, which is, is quite interesting, they've, they've sought to address uh, themselves as African countries to this debate about widening the mandate of, of, of the, the World Bank as part of the evolution roadmap, and whether the World Bank should take on additional goals around uh, climate. Um, and I think um, there's been this big emphasis on global public goods from the developed countries. And I think, you know, there's a variety of ways in which you can read that. But I think the, there's obviously the concern from the part of African countries that, um, you know, given a, a zero sum uh, game and a limited pot of money that uh, focusing more on, on global public goods like a reduction of, of carbon emissions, um, would lead to less uh, money for the historic uh, priorities of, um, of the World Bank in terms of poverty relief. Uh, so it's not to say that, um, 
you know, addressing poverty relief runs counter to uh, addressing climate. It's just that we need, again, more and more money uh, to do both. Um, but I think the um, the African position uh, as it stands is is quite interesting because it's not uh, per se opposed now to this uh, expansion to, to global public goods. Um, but uh, what it does say is that um, uh, it shouldn't be just uh, emissions reductions that are defined as as global uh, public goods, but they would like to see uh, equal uh, support for uh, things like food security, uh, water, uh, and energy access um, uh, in equal measure. Um, so I think that, I mean, obviously um, recalls the, the important point about the problems that were afflicted by today in terms of hunger and very real uh, humanitarian crises. You know, to what extent are these understood to be global uh, concerns? So that 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 uh, that said, um, so we need to obviously avoid false dichotomies, but at the same time focus very steadfastly on this question of of additional finance. Um, more is is very clearly needed. Um, an energy sector strategy that's based on on poverty eradication might focus on on clean cooking and and have some you know albeit minor emissions reductions component, but, um, you know, a, an energy strategy based around climate would obviously focus on uh, phasing out coal. And so you've got appreciable differences uh, there in terms of, you know, both having benefits for climate and development, but, but uh, you know, one having much more of one than the other and vice versa. Um, so I think um, this is obviously coming at a very critical time for the world in terms of thinking through uh, the, the politics of, of additional international finance for, for developing countries. Um, and we're in the middle of a wider debate um, in the UNFCCC COP context, it has to be acknowledged as well, where um, the, the, the COP is essentially has to come up with a uh, successor goal to the 100 billion. Um, and it's called the New Collective Quantified Goal. And a number of, 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 of uh, proposals have been put on the table. But I mean, here, once again, you, you see um, some countries arguing for a central role for the, uh, for the MDBs and others calling for, um, uh, for other um, institutions to, to play a role. And I, I think we can acknowledge that not all institutions are, 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 uh, are as well suited for all purposes. And certainly for the provision of, of grants, I think unequivocally that's that's not something which um uh which uh, a bank is, is is suited to do but i mean this is the 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 the, the one of the big matters for uh, for discussion is is how much in terms of grant equivalent finance uh will the global north be providing to the global south in this ma in this time of poly crisis uh where you know historically in the 1970s you had a 0.7% of of gni uh that was pledged uh, to developing countries on a grant equivalent basis, um, but uh, the the current efforts toward that are at only something like 0.3% uh, of, of GNI. Um, and now we have additional needs and and, and crises and uh, you know war and migration, uh, as well as uh, the innumerable and mounting impacts of of climate, um, which have led to some countries calling for. Uh, gr greater percentage uh, targets, uh, like 2% uh, of, of GNI for, for spending on grant equivalent uh, assistance. So, yeah, I mean, I think we do have um, these very clear messages maybe coming from the Global South on the one hand about uh, the need for more equitable governance, but also on the, the need for much more grant equivalent money. Um, and I think the question is, is what, uh, to what extent will, will Marrakesh send a strong message, a strong declaration, uh, if you will, uh, as is being discussed uh, from the perspectives of the, of, the, uh, of the global south of the developing countries. Um, and so I think that's, that's the question we face. And it's certainly no time for, for policymaker complacency or for, for complacency uh, amongst those of us that are adjacent to, to policymakers and, and politicians. Um, and so I hope that 
if the institutional conversation at the annual meetings isn't isn't up to par, we will have we will all have the courage to to, to say so. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there. Happy to say more later, maybe about uh, what different civil society might be planning as well. Um, but um, but yeah, thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Iskander, for that uh, that that perspective. Want to move now to questions. We this webinar is due to go to the quarter past the hour, so we got some time for that. So, if anybody, uh, I'm going to from speak of you to take a look at. Anybody has any questions or want to share their perspectives on the on the annuals, what they think will be the priorities and what should be happening, or as is against there any events planning? A lot of people are asking about events. Um, J. Tom Gambo asks, think, I think getting the IMF and the World Bank and key stakeholders, including policymakers and politicians, especially from the global south, to have clear and concrete actions and where possible, with a timeline addressing these recommendations, including calls from CSOs, would be great. It assures the most affected groups, uh, most affected groups, mostly marginalized citizens, hopes in terms of the well-being and development. Making commitment works by translating into actions is crucial at the moment, especially for developing countries. Citizens are earning, yearning for tangible actions, which is an excellent point. Any questions coming from, from the audience or any perspectives? Just feel free to raise your hand and then I can ask, and I'll ask you to share your video. Are we all incredibly shy or we are all incredibly informed? In lieu of questions, is can you share any any plans that you know are happening around the World Bank IMF in terms of CSOs? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to provide a few brief words, but but definitely non-exhaustively because there is really a plethora of stuff uh, happening. Uh, personally, for, for my part, from where we stand here in Morocco, uh, we've been quite involved with the um, the organizing of the uh, the environment and uh, climate uh, related uh, civil society organizations, uh, both nationally as well as in the sort of broader Arab and and African region. Um, and so, on that front, uh, with a with a big uh, environment and climate focus, uh, I think there's a, a number of actions planning uh in the planning. And um, I think there's there's one maybe meeting on the Tuesday afternoon, which uh, I can um, send details to for folks that are uh, interested. Um, but uh, beyond that, there are many other um, uh, events that are being planned for by various constituencies, parallel summits, counter summits, um, as well as sort of track 1.5 exchanges between governments and and uh, and uh, and CSOs. So uh, yeah, I mean, I invite other colleagues to, to, to share more of what they're doing, but I'll put my our, our contact information in the chat for folks that want to reach out. Thanks for that. And just to say, I will put together on the events page, which I share in the chat, but I'll put any resources that are relevant, including the, the PowerPoint that uh, Marianne shared with us. Anybody else? Um, Go ahead, yeah, if I may just complement a few more of the actions um, happening. Um, so there is a... A march on the 12th. Um, there is also a global day of action against the World Bank on the 13th. There is a People's Tribunal as well, organized by Fighting Equality Alliance. And there is the, um, on the 11th, there is the counter summit from the 12th to the 15th. Um, I can again include, uh, share some of some links with, with, with Kel so it can be, um, yeah. When it comes with all the information from the, this webinar, it comes together. I I don't think the program is is uh, live yet, but yeah, uh, it should be sometime soon. So yeah, I would expect for those in Marrakesh, there will be a, an, an extensive uh, uh, list of things happening. For those falling from apart, I would imagine a lot of comms and noise uh, coming as well. Thanks for that. And do we know what the uh, the how? Uh, what the word is, how lenient or how relaxed the authorities will be in Morocco around protests, or are they, sometimes they have these official protest zones in some, some countries, otherwise they take place in and around the World Bank meeting. Do you know how that's going to play out, uh, Iskander, or any colleagues in Morocco? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think um, I will say that Morocco prides itself on, on being, uh, trying to be a sort of um, exemplar um, maybe relative to some other countries in the in the region 
in terms of its openness to civil society. Um, and so by that token, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, I think, be seeing quite a bit of, um, of civil society uh, marches and, and that kind of thing that will be uh, uh, proceeding, obviously, under the, the, the supervision of, of the government to make sure that everything is, is safe. Um, but but um, I think it's, it's going to give quite a lot of room for, for the creativity of, of different civil society uh, groups. So I think we should be seeing quite a lot of stuff on a decentralized basis. Excellent. If that answers your question. Thank you. And I, Andrew from the Glasgow Action wants to come in on that. Do you, Andrew? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Andrew Nasdin here from the Glasgow Actions team. Uh, we're currently on the ground in Marrakesh. Um, I agree with everything that Iskander just said. Um, I would also encourage folks that uh, if you are participating in any civil society uh, counter summits, marches, protests, uh, now's a good time to like download signal on your phone, do your general security check that you would when traveling to any other country, but like do those things before you get here rather than waiting until afterwards. Um, make sure your emergency contacts are updated and that you're communicating with folks, especially folks in country um, via signal or other secure, safe means. Really useful uh, advice there, Andrew, from a, from a seasoned professional. Um, as, as, as we plan these meetings happen in different countries, that we have to get used to different customs and how those things change. Although I remember being at World Bank meetings in Washington where they were not particularly friendly to civil society and doing lots of lots of sort of cutting, clamping down events. Um, it's going to put some information, uh, as including his uh, email in the in the organ in the chat, so you can follow through what's happening uh, and the convenings that Climate Action Network are doing. As we know, in the World Bank meetings, there's sort of there's the official delegation meetings that are happening with the governments negotiating the finance ministers, World Bank government, World Bank governors. We also have the civil society forums that take place, which is you know the within the World Bank sort of network is kind of the, the official side events. And then of course we have those which are happening outside in the streets in terms of protests as well as the parallel and the counter summit. So it's excellent to see there's a very vivid and vibrant uh, discussions and, and showing a different ideas happening around World Bank meetings so that they are getting a wide range of perspectives not just that of the internal discussions within the, 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 the finance ministers and the governors. Is there any more questions coming from the from our very quiet audience? You guys know everything. You guys are very organized and, and feel confident as we go into the, the annuals next week. If we don't have any questions, I will give everybody a bit of time back. And just any final reflections coming from, from the panel before we, we move on? Yeah, I guess perhaps just one final reflection that I... I would have is that climate finance, we all agree, it's urgent, it's needed, it has to be additional, it goes align with development and in the context of the poly crisis. And I think moving forward, um, the actions that happen and the conversations that happens around these spaces like the World Bank and the IMF need to go hand in hand with a number of the climate negotiations happening in the own FCCC space, because climate finance is really central uh, to climate action. Unless we're able to really uh, unlock uh, uh, some of that, that to really cover all the, the, the needs that we need, uh, we'll be in big trouble. And so breaking the silos, and especially uh, uh, aligning a lot more the, the the climate finance needs with the wider picture of uh, 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 development and the multiple crises looking at you know the debt and you know taxation and and the, uh, the global governance of uh, economic decision making is essential so yeah um I would I would I think more and more those those spaces are important for a lot of us practitioner work in this used to work across a number of uh of them. Thank you. Thanks, Rihanna. And and we have a, a Jamie from Sharing Strategies is gonna share perspective as well as updates on your call tomorrow. Yeah, sure. And I just I mean it was just a quick and obvious point. It's more of a shout out for, for another partner's work, which is I think what all partners are identifying is the 
the gap between what's necessary and what is feasibly even possibly likely with current leadership, um, both at certain institutions and at, the, and at certain kind of key current shareholders. Um, and I mean, that, that, that kind of puts the ball back in some of our courts about how good a job we are doing or not doing in terms of advocacy communications, culture change and campaigning in key countries and how well those efforts are coordinated and funded and how ambitious and creative they are. Um, and without sort of, you know, uh, opening up a can of worms, I do think that the Black Sands has done some extremely interesting research on this point. I don't know if certainly, Kel, I'd encourage you to invite them to a future meeting and they'll be joining tomorrow um, at Sharing Strategies, giving an outline of some of their research about how we frame financial architectural reform in different key markets in a way that's more likely to be heard positively as opposed to negatively. Um, and therefore, that might help us kind of mount a better set of public campaigns, public facing campaigns, because the issue is not technical, really. It's political and it's communications and creative campaigning um, to generate the political capital. So that's just one overall point. Then the other one is in the person of RJ Banger, I just would encourage people to be quite nuanced and thoughtful about the individual um, who is still new in the job. And if there's a way in which people can be like, not damning of him, but encouraging um, of the individual, um, uh, it would be still a good idea because he's still malleable, he's still shaping, he's still trying to figure out what the job is. Um, so find a way to not decide that he's already lost, he's already failed in the judgments that are being cast um, because he's still trying. And that would just be my, you know, whatever nuance you can think about adding to whatever the critique of him will be. Think, just consider that. Um, um, so those are the those are the key points. I mean, I, you know, I, I suspect if you add up all the bits and pieces of what they'll say, it'll come to two hundred and fifty billion dollars more in lower rates of lending, lower cost of capital lending um, from the MDB system as a whole, with the majority of that from the World Bank, but some of it from the Asian Development Bank. 250 billion more of the next 10 years, which is a pimple on a dimple on an ant's left cheek, as RJ Banger had himself has acknowledged. Um, so, you know, um, but I think that is probably a number that they will float. Thanks for that, Jamie. And Jamie shared his sharing strategy call, which takes place tomorrow. And I encourage all those to participate in that. And if you want to dump the uh, details back in the chat for those who missed it, that'd be great. Biscuit, do you, you have some final comments before we wrap up? Yeah, happy to just just offer some very brief final thoughts and um, and thanks again to everyone that's come before. I mean, I think I think you know J Jamie is right to stress uh, the the um, the discrepancy uh, between what where the conversation is and the numbers that are currently on the table um, in terms of the policy discussions uh, versus what is uh, needed, um, and I think. That, that that obviously speaks to a need to really push obviously the the developed countries to to be a, a lot more ambitious in terms of the the amount of money that they're able to to put forward into the international financial system um, but also um, it requires all of us to be um, ambitious in terms of uh, how we push the the overton window and as as was said uh, thinking about um creative ways in which we can uh, change the, the conversation and 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 get at uh, the things in a more cultural uh, way <clears throat> the 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 poll that um or the polling rather that that uh, was cited by by Jamie uh, i think is 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 leaves us i think on a on a somewhat inspiring note because it uh, one of the things that it tells us is that um, when you uh, communicate to uh, an average citizen of, of the G7, just how much money is being spent, for example, on um, on military spending, most people aren't quite aware of that. Or when once told that, they they see it as well. If we're spending two percent on that, then then surely these countries should also be spending uh, two percent on uh, you know the, the crises of, of climate and development and and. Uh, Many of them assume that we already are, which we are, of course, very far from doing. 
Um, so that the, I think that there's a lesson there and perhaps a basis for inspiration. So I'll, I'll stop there. And um, as we say, mahbab um, in um, in Morocco. Excellent, brilliant. Well, I'd like to thank everyone uh, uh, on the panel for taking the time to share their thoughts and perspectives and the excellent overview of the annuals next week and for Iskander for helping pull this together and for all of those who attended for taking the time to, to hear these perspectives. We'll be sharing the information, as I said, on what will assemblies uh, event page. I put that in the chat. Uh, the video will be there as well as other resources. Uh, and please take a look out for future uh, assembly webinars and seminars. In the meantime, good luck for everyone in Marrakesh next week and good advocacy to you all.